We are giving thanks today for a real spiritual giant, Richard Baxter, 17th century English Puritan, which is actually one of the reasons I'm in black today, mm -hmm. because I'm historically commending the way he would think that I would address, if I at least if I'm talking about him. In fact, he would probably even have qualms about the stove. It actually is a little bit ironic that we celebrate him within the context of uh, feast day with the Eucharist. He, he wouldn't particularly like that, both in terms of the churchmanship, but also because he was a man who actually treasured obscurity. And after being involved in ways that literally changed the course of the Church of England, he retired to London and nobody actually even knew where he lived. Um, and this was somebody who a lot of church people knew through the biggest of the controversies. His enduring work are really two things. One is a literary work called The Reformed Pastor. And The Reformed Pastor, still read today, by the way, is an extraordinarily commendable manual about how to pastor a local church. For Baxter, the heart of Christian leadership in terms of pastoring a local congregation was really sort of set around a three-sided triangle. The first was a tender and heart relationship with God, our Father. Hence, the gospel lesson about the call to prayer. And having that kind of tender heart, he actually took his cue in that sense, from Cranmer, who really introduced into liturgy the whole idea of having that kind of heart relationship with God. If you go back to write one and just circle every time the word heart is mentioned, it's astonishing to see how it comes up again and again and again. And that was Cranmer's innovation. Baxter took that and really preached and taught in a way that invited people into that kind of tender and personal heart relationship with God based on the forgiveness of sins and being made right with God in Jesus Christ. Out of that, secondly, came an excellence and a commitment to biblical preaching. Um, anybody who strives at all to be faithful to teach and preach the scripture with, in the pulpit is indebted to a real, someone who set the pace for Anglicanism and its shape in a guy named Richard Baxter because that's part of what he was known for. And then the third thing was actually going to see people in their homes. Um, he would be astonished that there are clergy who never go visit people in their houses. That for him would be like, wait a second, how are you going to get to know them? How are they going to get to know you? How are you going to actually learn how to love and care for them? And to really use those home opportunities for discipleship. He did not shy away from asking hard questions, which is why we began with the Exodus reading on the Ten Commandments, because the Ten Commandments for him really was the standard for Christian behavior. And he would meet in homes and talk with people about how to live that out in an era where private morality was really considered something to be sort of made fun of. I mean, even the clergy were corrupt after all. I mean, and that was the sentiment. Baxter really was a beacon in the midst of that kind of sort of lack of lackadaisical life for a call to personal holiness and doing so within the context of genuine care for people. So he would never, he could never be reasonably in any way called a kind of legalist or somebody that was standoffish because even though he was rigorous, about the call to Christian life, it was always expressed in a t profoundly relational and compassionate way. He loved his people and they knew it. So what, do, what can we take from that? Well, I think actually the lessons are identical. That if you want to be someone who leads well, number one, it really is based upon that kind of personal passion for Jesus the knowledge of forgiveness of sins, a place in heaven, a place of confidence that comes out of that. Because you know that God is cleansing you. You don't deserve <laughs> to stand up here. But that in fact, it's always an action of God's mercy that you do so. Secondly, to really be committed, whether you preach or not, to be able to quote the New Testament, to be able to give a reason for the hope that is in you. 
In other words, a familiarity with the scripture so that when you talk with people about Jesus Christ, it's not merely an expression of personal experience. It in fact has authoritative weight in your experience by the very things that the scripture teaches. Otherwise, your experience is just as good as somebody else's. I mean, that's, that in and of itself is actually not a means for conversion, but actually invites people into a relationship. Is personal authenticity expressed through both experience and a way of saying, this is what the scripture teaches. I'm not just sort of making this up. In other words, a deep belief and an application in the authority of scripture. And thirdly, the capacity to care for people. So that it is always about building relationships, getting to know people even more deeply. Those are always the hallmarks of effective Christian leadership. A heart relationship, a capacity to talk about one's faith and to preach the scriptures effectively and to build relationships with people that allow you to be able to enter into their lives in a way that shows them that you actually really love and care for them. You're not just sort of up there squawking, but you're, to use another analogy, you're washing feet. And that's part and parcel of what it means to be a believer. We do not realize the debt we owe to Richard Baxter because for him, both in his life as well as in his writing, he lived that out in a way that actually shaped our understanding of what it means to be effective Christians. And so we're indebted to him. But I think more importantly, it's a way of looking at, okay, if I'm going to lead, how am I doing? And to always continue to be open to God shaping us into better servants that look more and more like Jesus. Amen. Amen.